другом. So let's pray together. Let's come to our Heavenly Father with our prayers. Father God, we would claim that promise in your word that if we seek to come near to you, then you will draw near to us. And this morning, Lord, we want to come near to you with the praise and adoration of our hearts. For you are indeed the great God, the great King above all gods. You are the one who is outside of time. You have always existed from eternity past to eternity future. In the beginning you spoke the creative word and all things came into being. And we pray this morning, Father, that you would speak your creative word in each one of our hearts, that new things may come into being there. We praise you for your faithfulness, for you are indeed a God who keeps his promises. You are one who hears his people when they cry out to you, and we, your people, worship you. We thank you for your great love, your love and your mercy and your grace poured out on our lives day by day. A love so great that you sent the Lord Jesus onto the earth to die for each one of us. And we thank you for his coming into the world, for his willingness to live amongst ordinary men and women such as us. We thank you for his ministry, for the wonderful miracles he did, for the wise words he spoke, for his example, the way in which he showed us how to live. And we thank you, Lord, that he became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross, that we might know what it is to be reconciled to you and to have that restored relationship with you. And we praise you for that wonderful resurrection on the third day, which reassures us that if we trust in him, then death is not the end, and we too will be raised to new life. And we look forward to that day when every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that the Lord Jesus is Lord of all. But Lord, as we seek to come near to you this morning, we realise afresh our own shortcomings. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrong things we've said and thought and done those hurtful words which passed our lips which hurt another and so they hurt you. Those times when we've been economical with the truth. The wrong thoughts we've entertained in our minds. Forgive us Lord for our wrong attitudes for our greed and our selfishness. We do thank you that that blood which was shed on that cross all those years ago has power today to set us free from sin, to make us clean again on the inside. And we pray that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, 
for without that power on the inside will just go on failing you. So grant us your spirit that we might have that power to make the right choices, that power to resist temptation, that we might be transformed into the people you would have us be. And we pray that that same Holy Spirit might move amongst us in this act of worship this morning, that he might show us more of Jesus, that he might minister to us at the deepest point of our need, for Lord, you know our needs better than we know them ourselves. But above all, we pray that all that we do this morning might bring glory to that wonderful name of Jesus, in whose name we ask these our prayers. Amen. The reading is from John chapter 6, starting to read at verse 1, the feeding of the 5,000. I'm reading from the New King James Version. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled he said to his disciples gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. I wonder if anyone remembers that Derrily advert, Derrily cream cheese, that was on TV oh, a number of years ago now. I'm talking about the one with a group of small boys who are on a coach trip 
and one of these boys has a triangle of Dare Lee in his lunchbox and the others are all trying to swap things for it. And the offers get more and more outrageously generous. But because Dare Lee is so absolutely wonderful, this little lad turns down all their offers and keeps his Dare Lee for himself. Normal small boy behaviour. People who are familiar with small boys might say the real miracle in this morning's reading was that the boy gave up his lunch rather than trying to sell it or trade something for it. Those of us who've grown up in the church have been hearing this story from childhood. So this morning I want to try and do something a bit different with this account. I want to look at the different people who were involved, with Jesus of course, in making this miracle happen. There were real people with real hang-ups, real strengths and real weaknesses, just like us. Let's see what we can learn from them. We'll start by looking at Philip. In verse 5, Jesus asks Philip, Where shall we buy bread that all these people might be fed? But why pick on Philip? Well, according to Luke's account of this miracle, it took place near Bethsaida and Philip was from Bethsaida. We know that from John chapter 1. So Philip was the man on the ground, the man with local knowledge. Just think, if you are in an unfamiliar town, perhaps on holiday, and you want to know, say, where the public toilets are, or, or the chip shop, and if it's any good, or some other vital piece of information, who do you ask? Do you ask that gentleman over there in the violently coloured shirt who's festooned with cameras and light meters and binoculars and goodness knows what else? Of course you don't. He's obviously a visitor like you. Instead, you look for a local, someone walking the dog or carrying their shopping home. So Jesus asks Philip where they can buy bread so that the crowd can be fed. But in the following verse we have the detail that Jesus already knows what he's going to do and he's just testing Philip to see what he'll say. Philip replies along the lines, oh, it's impossible. We'd need a huge amount of bread for everyone to have even a little. It's impossible. You see, Philip was looking at the problem through natural eyes. He'd left Jesus out of the equation and was trying to figure out a solution, depending on human resources alone. He's thinking, oh, the baker's miles away. He'll probably be shut by the time we get there. And even so, we'd need so much bread, such a huge amount of bread. How would we get it back? This just isn't going to work, Jesus. Perhaps in the face of the problem, he'd forgotten who Jesus was. He'd forgotten that Jesus was right there beside him. And sometimes when we face difficulties, we can be like that, struggling on our own, leaving Jesus on the outside. When we consider the needs of the world, indeed the needs of this community, perhaps even needs in our own families and friendship circles, there is no way 
those needs can be met relying on human resources alone. We must bring Jesus and his power into the situation. I'm not saying we should throw reason away, but we must be prepared to go beyond reason and into faith because God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So much for Philip. Then there's Andrew. Now we don't find Andrew mentioned very much in the Gospels, but whenever he is mentioned, he's bringing people to Jesus. What a thing to be remembered for. It was Andrew who brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. And later on in John's Gospel, we find that incident where a group of Greeks approach the disciples saying they want to see Jesus. And it's Andrew that brings those Greeks to Jesus. And now, in our passage this morning, Andrew is bringing this little lad with his five loaves and two fishes to Jesus. Perhaps Andrew thought he had found the beginning of an answer here. It seems Andrew has a sense of faith, a sense of expectancy. Unlike Philip, he seems to be looking beyond the natural. He seems to be looking at the problem with the eyes of faith. And I wonder, how do we look at our problems? through natural eyes like Philip or through the eyes of faith like Andrew remembering what Jesus has done in the past believing he can work in the current difficulty Still on the subject of faith and expectancy, we'll move on to consider the part played by the disciples as a whole. But first, a little mental exercise just to make sure you're all still awake. Have you ever considered just how much food we're talking about here? John tells us 5,000 men had as much as they wanted. Matthew, in his account of the miracle, adds an unspecified number of women and children to the 5,000 men. So for a working figure, we're thinking of 5,000 solid main meals as an absolute minimum. Now, think how much room is occupied by one main meal and multiply that by 5,000. Well, that's like an old EU food mountain, isn't it? Put another way, away, presuming one main meal per person per day, it would last one person somewhere between 13 and 14 years. Trust me, that's right, I've done the math. Now here's another question. When were the loaves and fishes actually multiplied? When were they increased from what they were, five loaves and two fishes, to this great volume of food? It's not clear in scripture did it happen this way? Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes and he gives thanks and the food becomes more and more and more until Jesus disappears from view in a sea of fish sandwiches. 
Well, if that's how it did happen, distribution would have been a nightmare. They had no wheelbarrows in that desert place. There's never a supermarket trolley in sight when you need one. I prefer to think it happened this way. Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes, gives thanks, and the loaves and the fishes remained just the same. Five of one, two of the other, the same size, occupying the same volume. And Jesus divides them up between the disciples, says, go, serve the crowd. Now, put yourself in the disciples' shoes at this point. There were 5,000 ravenous men out there, not to mention the women and the now grizzling children. And you know how some people can get a bit irritable when they're hungry? Do you know people like that? Well, there were probably some of those in the crowd too. And what the disciples had to give them was nothing in the face of the need. Imagine poor Thomas, for instance. Here he is, approaching his first group of hungry people. And all, all he's got for them is a small fish tail and half a hovis. He reaches the group and serves the first person and the second person and the third person and, and there's enough to go around. It appears that the food is increased as it's given out. The food is increased as it's given out. I suppose the disciples could have rebelled, but they didn't. Rather, they obeyed Jesus, presumably expecting things to happen. And there are times when we need to step out in faith, believing God's going to work in our situation. Like the loaves and the fishes, the circumstances might be the same, but we are called to walk by faith, not by sight. And we'll find that as we go and do what God tells us to do, the necessary resources will be there. Whatever it is God is calling you to do, he will also equip you to do it. It's like he's got a long, long workbench. Come with me to God's spiritual workbench. It stretches as far in either direction as it needs to. It's full of tools, every conceivable kind of tool. And it doesn't just have one of every sort of tool. There are lots of each sort of tools. Tools for right-handed people. Tools for left-handed people. Tools for people with small hands. Tools for people with large hands. Even tools for people whose hands are all thumbs when it comes to doing anything practical like mine are. There are tools there just for you. And I believe God's saying, come to me, come to my workbench and take whatever it is you need to do the work to which I've called you. Come and receive whatever it is you need to do the job. And no more excuses. No more excuses. Philip, Andrew, the disciples. Then finally there's the little lad. The miracle couldn't have happened without him and what he had. 
it started out as an ordinary day for him and suddenly he finds himself caught up in the action. I wonder how he attracted attention. Children are often overlooked in crowds, but perhaps it was just sheer persistence on his part. He was sure Jesus could use what he had, and he was right. He didn't really have very much, but he gave to Jesus absolutely everything he had. Now I've got a bit of a reputation for liking my food and I'm sure if I'd been in this little lad's place I'd have been tempted to keep some food back. A sort of insurance policy. Just in case it went wrong. Just in case the food ran out before it reached me. But this little boy doesn't. He gave to Jesus everything he had. And in Jesus' hands, it was sufficient to meet the need of the crowd. We are aware of many needs in the world and in our community. And if we are to reach out effectively in Jesus' name, both as individuals and as a church, then like this little lad, we need to give absolutely everything to Jesus. All we have and all we are. And perhaps what we have to offer seems so inadequate, so insignificant in the face of the need. But the miracle is Jesus can take what we give him and like the loaves and the fishes, he can increase it. He can make it sufficient and use it and us to meet the needs of those around us. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? We've covered a lot of ground this morning. I'll try and recap. Hold on to whatever it is God is saying to you. We thought about Philip looking at problems through his natural eyes, forgetting Jesus is there. And Andrew looking at problems through the eyes of faith, involving Jesus in them. How do you view your problems? The disciples obeying Jesus, stepping out in faith, even though it appeared their resources were inadequate. God's workbench, come and receive what you need to do the work. And the little lad, enabling the miracle by giving absolutely all he had to Jesus, not holding anything back in case. Amen. Let's just hold a couple of minutes silence there for reflection and silent prayer. Let's pray together.
Amen. Father God, as we bring you these gifts of money, we would bring ourselves as well, all that we have and all that we are. And when we consider the needs around us, Lord, what we have to offer is nothing in the face of the need. But we pray that as we give ourselves to you, that you would take us and equip us and use us, that you would multiply those resources and use us to reach out with your love to those around us. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> 